Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll be starting the very last uh, panel uh, at the conference. Uh, it will be dedicated uh, to the uh, post-Soviet memory region with a question mark. So we're going to uh, explore uh, whether this uh, concept is suitable for uh, the region, uh, geographical region we are uh, actually uh, all in uh, in Warsaw. Uh, we will have two uh, uh, two presentations. The first one will be uh, given by Rasa uh, Balochkaita uh, from uh, uh, Toldas Magnus University uh, from Lithuania. Um, and uh, it will be followed by the presentation uh, by uh, Nelly Bekus uh, from the University of uh, Exeter. Uh, the presentation will be approximately 20, 25 uh, minutes. Uh, and uh, our discutant will be uh, Simon uh, Lewis, uh, probably well known to uh, all of you as an uh, organizer, uh, but also a person involved in a number of uh, projects uh, in uh, the central and uh, central eastern uh, Europe. Uh, and I will pass the microphone to uh, Rasa. Could you please start? Okay. Can you hear me? Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my presentation is about basically this research and my presentation is about how the public memory of the Soviet period is changing in Lithuania from the early post Soviet years to nowadays. And I would like to start my presentation with a question. Uh, have some of you have ever seen such an uh, such a such a thing and do you know what it is? Sorry? Yeah, and uh, what is the <laughs> the the thing? It's a robot composed of the Soviet, uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet cigarettes or the blocks of the Soviet cigarettes. Why it's on the screen, uh, you will see later during my presentation. And I'll start with a very brief review of the uh, theoretical premises. So my research is based on a premises that past, like history, is a process, it's never fixed, it's always invented, socially constructed that there is, as it was discussed before, there is individual, individual memories and uh, even at somatic level, but there are also collective memories that are culturally transmitted and socially constructed. And, well, uh, yeah, so some regimes of memories appear and disappear and what we have, like a communities, of mem uh, communities of remembrance, how people share certain versions of the past. And hypothesis of my research that the memories, the remembrance of the Soviet period in post in post Soviet Lithuania has developed in a three chronological stages, in three qualitatively different stages. What you see in uh, overlapping numbers, it's not a, not a typing, mistyping, but it's I, I see that it's this periodization is kind of very relative. So majorly I see it's like a three qualitatively different stages. And in time, they are kind of overlapping. The discourses of memory, the cultures of the remembrance are overlapping. And now I'm going to review it like one by one. So the very early stage that started immediately after fall of the Soviet Union is very strongly focused on a national sufferings, on gulag, deportation, physical violence, deaths, and other losses. And the major, major actors who are shaping this memory is either state uh, or church. And I would say the church plays a major role, as in state only secondary role. And there are some examples of this kind of public, semi-institutionalized or institutionalized memory. One of them is a museum of genocide opened in Vilnius in 1992. And here you see some how it looks like, and the message is clear. It's like sufferings of Lithuanian nations, Lithuanian nation, and mostly of Lithuanian nation. Also, ethnic minorities are included. And this is an exposition de uh, devoted to the defenders of Lithuanian independence who died on January 13 in 1901. It was opened in Vilnius in 1992, as well at the same time as the museum, and you also see a very clear use of religious symbols, right? Another example is Hill of Crosses, devoted to the victims of occupation. It was built spontaneously in Konas, in, uh, just, uh, it began in 19, uh, in 19, 
just after fall of Soviet Union. And there are, it was kind of communal initiative or a lot of individual initiatives and a lot of crosses. And it's like even sometimes there's like a, a factory or a shoe factory or some department of the shoe factory. They collect money and they erect cross and they write it in a signature in a very Soviet way, collective of the factory, that and that, which sounds very Soviet. <laughs> And the crosses are for different occasions, for deportees, for Romas Kalanta, who committed self-immolation in, in, in 72, uh, for victims of, uh, for unborn children, for victims of abortion, for political prisoners, for victims of KGB, and so forth and so on. And this is the former review of the place, the form, uh, before, the, before the fall of the Soviet Union. It was the location of the Soviet tank to commemorate, you know, Soviet, uh, Soviet victory in the World War II, and after fall of the Soviet system, it's com it has come. The place was completely transformed. There's another initiative why I've said in an early stage, in an early past Soviet years, there is a very the church plays even stronger role than the than the state. Uh, this is a partisan team park. I don't know how to call it properly. Partisan team park. It is established by the priest by Monsignores Monsignor. Svarinskas in uh, 1996. And there is like an alley of crosses and uh, each cross is devoted to the troop of partisans and also some other crosses like devoted uh, for uh, President Reagan for some reason or Pope of, <laughs> uh, Pope of Rome and so forth and so on. So it's just like a beautiful location, beautiful, very beautiful, very quiet kind of public park. And, with the, and when you follow the path, there are a lot of crosses. And as another, again, church is one of the major players in shaping the public memory or collective memory. This is a church of Lithuanian sufferers. It was built in 1903 and it was consecrated in 2006. And here you see like an alley of different kind of statues or sculptures. You see it's like, it's, it's a little visible. It's not all of it. And all the, this kind of statues, crosses, uh, this space are uh, also devoted to different kind of sufferers, like uh, Lithuanian partisans or mothers of the par Lithuanian partisans, uh, victims of KGB, uh, political prisoners, victims of Chernobyl accident, uh, victims uh, of abortion or unborn children, and so forth and so on. So there are a few examples of this of this statues and also extensive use of religious language. This is a monument to the victims of Chernobyl. This is a monument to victims of KGB. This is a monument to the unborn children. And this is actually, uh, I don't know which year, I think in the 93, they have had a symbolic funeral with an empty coffin like a, to commemorate the victims of abortions performed during the Soviet years. And this is just a, impressive view how it looks like uh, during the sunset. And so again, uh, this is another initiative and it's all, all it's uh, state initiative, not church initiative. It's Memorial Complex in Columbarium in Tuscalene Peace Park, opened in 2008. And it's a location where kind of mass murder happened after Lithuania became part of the Soviet Union. And this is this also part of memorial complex. Just because of lack of time, I uh, just you know to sum up the, what is the first period. So the first, the first period, the first kind of kind of you know uh, early discourse of remembering the Soviet past is st st based very strongly in nationalist and Catholic perspective. So critique of the Soviet period is like it was like sufferings of nation and suffering of, of our Catholic people. And this, these sufferings are articulated very much in a, in a religious language. And so you see crosses and other symbols everywhere. And as I have said already, there are two major actors, church and state, and even state plays a secondary role and the church plays a major role. But from 2001, there is kind of a little bit change. This, this narrative of suffering, this co of collective grievance is a little bit destabilized. And this is the thing that most of you probably know some kind. It's a Grutas Park. It's a park. Uh, again, it's like a team park where this, uh, one businessman collected all the Soviet monuments and accommodated them in, a, in a one location. So it's this 
what is the ambivalence about the park? It's not quite clear what is the emotional meaning, what is the political message. It's kind of a little bit like uh, ed it has educational elements, it has some kind of political message, it has some elements of the show and entertainment. So it's already very complex compared, for example, if you compare the Grutus Park with the Genocide Museum. Genocide Museum is sending very clear message, okay? loss, grievance, pain, and respect to, to the victims of commoners. But in this case, it already, it's already introducing elements of entertainment, but education and entertainment. As you see, there's uh, local, local restaurants uh, in order in a Soviet fashion, and this is kind of Rodonasis Campalis, uh, the Red Room, a uh, room of propaganda. And there was also the idea to make a train. There's also a lot uh, loud music uh, played through the loudspeakers. And there was idea that the visitors of the park uh, would have a possibility to take a train, kind of. But this, is, this idea was blamed, publicly blamed, and it was canceled because it was like too much of the show in, a, in, a pl in this place. <coughs> Another significant aspect that is destabilized the, the shared, the, the narrative of grievance, collective narrative of grievance, is a book, Jolie. It's written by Marius Andrischkevichus, and his English name is Green. And it's kind of novel about Soviet, anti Soviet partisans, but it's written in a very realistic manner and uh, with a lot of uh, descriptive details and obscenities of everyday life, like the partisans, like, you know, urinating or having erotic dreams or some, you know, very primitive facts of, uh, of everyday life. And it's challenging this image of partisans as being noble, as partisans as being heroes, and challenging the image of partisans as something sacred. And the partisans, as you probably already read, partisans are called as primitive lads with very poor understanding about dignity and humanness, and so forth and so on. Uh, because of the lack of time, I won't read the last quote about Yona Jamit, is the head of partisan movement who was uh, who was p uh, remained paralyzed in a bunker for a few years until he was arrested and killed in L in Lubyanka prison. So it's again, it's a shift of narrative, and. Another aspect, this is when it's, uh, another, another uh, kind of uh, enterprise, <laughs> enterprise of memory, it's a bunker, 1984. It's an underground socialist museum, an interactive survival drama that was started in 2007. And it's kind of, again, it's still dealing with the same topic, with the gulag, physical violence, surveillance, uh, you know, physical abuse and but still you have complete but you here you have completely different perspective instead like a museum of genocide we use like you know paying tribute and respect to the victims of deportations here it's very interactive and again it was very challenging and it caused big debate in Lithuania that you know socialism shouldn't be funny and you shouldn't uh, Soviet communism should not be funny and you shouldn't do it for money you shouldn't make show out of that and but still it I think it still still go, goes on and it's again the many people attack it because of the poor ethics of of the entire enterprise but the organizers advocate they say this like a educational show and people contemporary generation they have to learn and they have to know and this is a good opportunity it's for the second period the, the the second kind of the second okay let's call it period it's another enterprise at the Cold War Museum at the former Plokstina missile base. It was opened in 2012. And it's a museum, Cold War Museum, with a lot of information about this nuclear Cold War atmosphere and uh, nuclear weapons and so forth and so on. So it's, again, it's a still dealing with the same, the security, war, antagonism, violence, but it's new perspective. Uh, it's not focused on national sufferings, but it's educational, just technically, technical education about things. And it's, it also has element of entertainment, like little bit of show, little bit of jokes, little bit of, you know, little bit of everything. So combination of two aspects, political and 
sorry, combination of two aspects. One is educational, one is uh, entertainment. But it doesn't convey very strong political message. And as the, third, the last one for the second period, the nuclear bunker is a private collection established by a successful businessman in Kaunas. So it's again, it's focus on the safety, war history, and it's purely educational. So it's, it has a very rich collection of Cold War kind of equipments. And to sum up the second period of remembrance, the second version of this, remembering Soviet past. There is still, the major major topics remain like gulag, war, violence, KGB sur surveillance, technologies of surveillance, technologies of interrogation. But what is different? It's kind of, it shifts from, it's emotional distancing. This, the, new, this, the, the new discourse is introducing new, new ways of saying things, okay? It's not sad anymore, it's not tragic. It's not traumatizing, but it's introducing new range of emotions. Instead of plain suffering, there is emotional distancing, doubts, elements of horror, elements of uh, elements of entertainment and fun. So it's a little bit trying to people are trying. You see a lot of new actors like private business, private business people, uh, kind of cultural institutions, and they try to find a new way of approaching the Soviet past. And the uh, major aspects, I, I don't have much time left, but uh, there's a major, major part what I, was one, uh, what, the, what I was willing to talk about is like the third way of seeing that Soviet past. And it, the, the third pattern of seeing the Soviet past uh, emerged just a few years ago. And the major actor is Andrew Sushkulis. He is a columnist and journalist. He does a uh, lot of restaurant interviews. He, publish, he has his own talk show. And he published, like I think, six books about, like uh, tra mostly travelogues, and two books about the Soviet uh, Soviet period. And the books are clearly focused on not on gulag, not on physical violence, not on political, but on economical, uh, economic things and on everyday life. The book is divided to chapters like the way we ate, the way we dressed, the way we talked, the way we spent time, the way we loved. And he's using like very, very strong language. He's kind of a songwriter for capitalism. And his, he's open about his attitude that, and as you see the quote, uh, that Soviet champagne was as, as much similar to the real champagne as the dead cat near garage is similar to the real tiger in the zoo. And, and it's like really funny. So it's like the political agenda of like, suffering, loss, grievance, is completely erased. And you know, if you, <laughs> some people dislike him very much, but I mean, I, I, saw you, I see you smiling. And so this completely, the, his memories of the Soviet period are just amusing. It's completely fun, amusing, anecdotal, and supposed to make, to make it, to make, to make, supposed to make you laughing. And, and as, what is, He's describing these uh, effects of everyday life, different aspects of everyday life. And he's describing what kind of effects these things had on a Soviet person. And he describes the Soviet person who ate very poor food, like a lot of potatoes and meat. And he had very bad body shape, who wore dark, heavy clothes, uh, who, was, uh, who has limited access to information. His worldviews were shaped by the very boring Soviet films and very boring Soviet newspapers. So he, he, the Soviet person used very, very kind of plain language, so he was kind of infantilized. And so it's a few more quotes that uh, he was deprived of few, few more quotes that the Soviet citizen was dressed so badly that he was so different from the civilized world as medieval peasantry collecting food leftovers at the walls of monastery. And he's kind of reversing like the traditional Marxist critique of consumerism tells that consumption or consumerism is something very negative that distracting of and re-diverting your attention to super and your energies to something superficial, false needs, and so forth and so on. But for Andres Ushkalnis, this consumption, diversity, possibility to consume is equal to culture and civilization itself. So the civilized person is the one who can consume good food, good drinks, good wine, good champagne, 
can travel abroad, who can choose the books to read, who can choose the films to watch. And, you know, this is for him, it's like an equal to civilization. And he describes in his book how the Soviet person is deprived, basically deprived of, of options, deprived of dignity by depriving him of cons consumption. consumption. There are few more aspects. There's like the way we lived, and he describes like lack, lack of space, lack of domestic space, sameness of furniture, and this, this desperate worship of Western commodities. It's lack of space. Again, these things have very negative emotional and mental effects. Lack of space, domestic space, results in emotional tensions. And uh, loss of dignity, but because like you have like four or five people sleeping in the same room, and he describes how does it affect inti intimate lives, and how does, affect, how does it affect love relations, how does it affect relations between ch uh, children and parents, and how it results in a kind of loss of dignity. And this is illustrated with like the book is illustrated with very typical. Uh, Soviet images and other issues targeted in the book is like the way we worked and he describes that the work in the Soviet Union was just not not as not as not as a platform for professional achievements but it was just a place of control that you're being under control and you know directed to do that and that instead of really working and developing your own capacities and achieving personal success and financial independence and the chapter the way we spoke He's criticizing Soviet journalism and Soviet media as a collection of platitudes, and he describes later what effects it has on people. He said, like, you know, kind of people really lack topics to discuss. Even if they have parties, they talk platitudes. And one of these platitudes is, why don't you eat anything? Because, and she says, it has nothing to do with reality because there is a lot of food, of white salad, of meat, of Russian vodka, of Soviet vodka. And this, the, the, the words, the, the, the sentences, the tool has nothing to do with reality. But people keep repeating it because, why? Because they are deprived of good films, they are deprived of good media, they cannot travel abroad, they cannot express themselves, themselves at work, and you know, they simply have nothing to talk about, so they keep repeating the platitudes. And also the way we laughed, he describes this kind of lack of, you know, again, it's complete shift of the focus from people who have been deprived of the freedom, who, who have been suffering in Gulag, and it's a shift for com complete, shift towards Soviet subject of late socialists who was deprived of domestic space, nice champagne, and good condoms. So it's a completely different perspective. And well, so this is re replicates what, already, what I have already said, like uh, when the traditional Marxist critique sees consumption as something negative that is diverting the human energies to something false, for Andrew Sushkalnis is exactly this, not the consumption is stupidifying the person, but lack of consumption, lack of choice, lack of opportunities, he has very heavy stupidifying effects on the Soviet people. And he refers to very popular, I don't know how you're familiar with Anatoly Kaspirovsky, he was a Soviet psychiatrist, and in the break of the Soviet Union, when there was an entire collapse of everything, he was very popular because he had his own TV show, and he was broadcasting collective hypnosis to all Soviet Union. And people used to put uh, like glasses, <laughs> glasses of water in order to be ch in front of TV in order to be charged with positive energy. <laughs> and Andrew Sushkalnis brings this case to tell, look what the Soviet Union did to people. <laughs> that these people have been deprived of good knowledge, of good information, good films, good everything. And at the end, instead of emancipating them from exploitation, false consciousness, they produce this kind of idiots. And this is why I, uh, why I put this at the beginning. He also describes this extreme boredom, and he says that uh, there was lack of commodities, and women used to knit napkins and in order to bring some individual style to the apartments. But he says, this is a very deep irony, because the napkins have been identical all over Soviet Union as well. So this is for females, and for the males, he describes the, the cosmos robot, and he says, do you imagine the degree of despair that adult men are collecting boxes of cigarettes and constructing a robot 
who of you would do something like that today with internet, with possibilities, with traveling, with freedom, with films? And he says, these, these robots have been placed, typically went to the room of the teenager and collected a lot of dust during the, during the years. So basically, this is to sum up. And well, what happened after the gospel by Ushkalnis was published? in 2014 and 15, there were some minor, these are not related to his books, at least I don't know any connection. Some of kind of one room of Soviet interior in Kona City Museum was opened just kind of a few months ago. And in, uh, also one room uh, uh, devoted to Soviet everyday life was opened in a museum of technique or technology in Vilnius also at the same time. So there is a shift of, of popular consciousness, the shift of how popular consciousness, public consciousness is perceiving the Soviet year. And it's a shift from nationalist perspective, from a religious perspective, towards very capitalist and consumerist perspective. And, well, this is basically, I'm just summing up my findings. Uh, maybe I just stop with this slide. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, and uh, now we move uh, to the uh, second paper that will be presented by uh, Nelly Pekus. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I need to launch to the point. Okay, uh, my paper is going to be focused on a very different aspect of post-Soviet reality uh, because I'll be talking about the commemoration and even more uh, about the commemorative date which, which is the 11th of April. And this is a day uh, which is marked as an international day of liberation of Nazi concentration camp inmates. So this is a long name. I'll Try not to repeat it every time, so we'll just remember that this is an international day. This day actually has a pretty long history in the memorial calendar of observances in Europe, which is, which is going back to uh, early post-war years. And this day actually is related, this is a day of liberation of Buchenwald camp as opposed to 27th of January, which is a date of liberation of Auschwitz. So during the first early post-war years, uh, this, is, this was pretty much present date, uh, largely uh, observed in France, in, in, actually in many uh, European countries, uh, and it was supported by uh, post uh, uh, anti-fascist communists. Uh, resistance fighters. But you, uh, later on it was actually mar marginalized because it was kind of replaced by this Holocaust remembering. But what I'm going to discuss today is this how it was reinvented, this 11th of April, it was re-entered re the calendar of commemoration. And actually the way how it was reintroduced uh, into the calendar of memories, uh, the commemoration to plate, uh, present in the way how, how it's been um, commemorated, uh, the logic of coordination of different agencies involved into the process of reinvention. So actually, when you look at all these aspects of this commemoration, you can clearly see that this became, this, this, this date can be viewed as a, as a construction of the alternative to the European Holocaust commemoration on the 27th of January. Uh, the date, 11th of April, is marked by Russian agency, news agency, RIA, as an international day of liberation of Nazi concentration camp inmates. According to, to the RIA agency, this day was established to commemorate the international uprising of Buchenwald prisoners. 
the Russian internet page the calendar of events, which is calendar.ru, which is the most comprehensive actual resource on holidays and memorial days on the Russian language internet, refers to the 11th of April in two categories, uh, in Great Patriotic War events and International Days of Observance. There is also an article on this day of observance in Russian Wikipedia. It refers to RIA as the main source and even mistakenly actually claims that it was established by the United Nations, which is actually not true. At least I haven't found any traces. The inter information of this, on this inter international day, however, is not to be found in any other languages and if anywhere except the Russian international news agency Sputnik, which works also in English language. And it, it is previously known as the Voice of Russia. The piece of information provided by RIA serves as a starting point for hundreds or actually thousands of publications across, across the Russian and post-Soviet media that report on various remembrance events dedicated to the memory of victims of Nazi concentration camps and the events which take, in, take place on this day. For example, the number of entries dedicated to this event counts up to 100,000 in Russian language only, but there are also some others. In Moscow, usually on that day, there is a memorial rally at Poklone Hill. It's held, uh, this is the tragedy of the People Monument, uh, which you can see. The monument was erected in the memory of former Nazi concentration camp prisoners in 1996. And this, is an actually, this monument is an integral part of the Victory Memorial Park on Poklone Hill in Moscow. Rallies are traditionally organized by the International Union of Former Juvenile Prisoners of Fascism. The union itself was created in 1988 as the Union of Former Juvenile Prisoners in Soviet Union. After the disintegration of Soviet Union, actually this union was reinvented already as an international union, which provided platform for cooperation between all national committees or national branches of this international union of, of union of juvenile, former juvenile prisoners. So these events are normally attended by former Nazi camp prisoners, their descendants, and, but, they actually, but they do have very profound public appeal because they engage a lot of educational institutions, cultural institutions, and have a quite wide media coverage. Apart from that, they also uh, have very wide support by, of local governments. So ceremonies are usually attended by top officials, with the exception of Baltic states, where in, instead of top officials, these rallies are supported by Orthodox Church. So alongside with rallies, there are traditional ceremonies of fly, flower laying, the monuments and memorial sites which are dedicated to this Nazi camp prisoners. There are concerts, there are lessons of heroism at schools, uh, various exhibitions in public libraries, museums, uh, which take place across Russia and other post-Soviet states. What is also interesting, governmental educational resources provide quite a lot of support supporting materials, like for example, proposed scenarios for lessons of heroism, uh, literature, uh, they pro provide PowerPoint presentations for this type of events. In this way, actually I forgot, this is the International Union of Former Juvenile Prisoners, this is a website. Okay, I'll go there for them. So if you look at the way how the whole this internet, uh, educational support is provided and informational support is provided, you can clearly see that it's, it is very similar to what can be found, for example, on the United Nations web website uh, with educational materials and information product recommended for the observance of the commemoration of Holocaust victims on the January 27th. So, in fact, the status of this April 11th in post-Soviet countries clearly creates the impression of maintaining a parallel memory on former prisoners of Nazi concentration camps. The symbolism of this date, the date of liberation of Buchenwald, as opposed to January 27th, as the day of liberation of Auschwitz, 
appears to have a significant, a special meaning in the commemoration of victims. And this symbolism goes back to the early post-war uh, years, as I mentioned. The history of Buchenwald, of liberation, liberation of Buchenwald, compiled by a RIA agency, for example, and it's reproduced every year in all post-Soviet media, on, uh, on the 11th of, April, 11th of April, tells the story of heroic uprising in, of Buchenwald camp. This is like short a uh, version of this information. This concise story mentions only shortly the red flag raised by underground rebels, and actually doesn't mention at all that the resistance was organized by, mostly by communists. Equally neutral information can be found on the website of Buchenwald camp because there is a museum, memorial complex and museum. So it's quite obviously that communist involvement of communists in the underground resistance at Buchenwald lost its appeal in contemporary conditions. It's, it's not relevant, it's not important anymore. But imme immediately after the war, it actually it was very much important because it, this fact was recognized and used very effectively in promotion of memory narrative on the struggle of communist anti-fascists against Nazis. So the Camp Buchenwald was viewed as a symbol of political victims who were also heroic fighters and played essential role in memorialization of World War II among anti-fascists in many European countries. Oh my God. In those days, in early fo uh, late 40s, April 11th was a day with a profound international anti-fascist connotation which could be proudly kind of communicated across East-West divide. But with the beginning of Cold War and rising tensions between East and West, the political prisoners organizations such as, because there was, a, I, I probably missed this moment, because this day, 11th of April, was actually established as, official, as, a, as an official observance day by the Federation of it called first International Federation of po for Former Political Prisoners. But with the beginning of Cold War, uh, this, this institution actually lost its importance and any appeal in the West. And it's imp in the importance of the 11th of April actually also became more and more reduced only to the post-Soviet countries. For example, in GDR, Buchenwald was entitled the role of major pantheon of heroic resistance fighters and the self-liberation of the camp because this is an important fact that the camp had the uprising which liberated itself so this, uh, uh, just, be just before the arrival of American troops. So memory narrative developed on the eastern side of the Iron Curtain preferred to commemorate these communist fighters rather than Jewish victims. But at the same time, on the other side of the Berlin Wall, the association between communist ideology and post-war anti-fascist discourse that marginalized Holocaust, made, Holocaust and Jewish victims made it much easier for West to listen to the voice of victims of rational persecutions above all Jews. So for them, Auschwitz became the symbol of Nazi crimes as well as, of, as, well as uh, collective shame and guilt. In the context of Cold War, the politicization of memorial work on both sides of the Iron Curtain was combined with corresponding political line. So communist states combined it with anti-Western political propaganda, while the West, with all its anti-communist implications, matched honoring Nazis victims with the pursuit of their own political agenda. So, for example, even comparing the Stalinism and Nazism did more than con to condemn communism because it also allowed to downplay the uniqueness of Nazis' regime. This was a quote from Tony Judd, actually. So it was that, at that time, in uh, exactly 1950, when the, also the term victim of fascism was discarded by Philipp Auerbach for its communist connotations, and pro he proposed to replace it with the victims of Nazism, so that to, to completely cut the, the connotations. 
So since then, since then, the previously <laughs> common enemy, Nazism, became even named, even became named differently, like Nazis and fascists. The fall of Berlin Wall in 1989 brought a hope the memory of World War II could provide a kind of solid ground for reunification. So at that time, it even uh, seemed to be very possible the integration of Western and Eastern perspective onto the common paradigm of remembering could, be, uh, could become a one of this, those building bricks in a new European home. And some changes did occur because, for example, in post-Soviet countries, certain uh, consideration of Holocaust memory well, became taken into account. The real unification of European and post-Soviet memory spaces, uh, of course, have never, have never been achieved. Because uh, political tra uh, transition in former socialist states and EU enlargement resulted in the formation of new divisive line. And while in the European history of remembering, the victims of uh, World War II, the focus on Holocaust became the foundation myth for United Europe and it became, as uh, Leda Asman said, a moral yardstick for new member <coughs> states uh, since 2005, and at the same time, the, the number of human losses in Soviet territories, like 20 million, among, among them uh, 10 million of civilians, remained largely unnoticeable and almost forgotten. So none of post-Soviet countries except Baltic states has a commemoration day 27th of January included into the official calendar of observance. Several attempts have been made, for example, to include commemoration of Holocaust into the official calendar in Russia, uh, which is a country with a very considerable Jewish com uh, community. It happened in 2001 by the Foundation Holocaust. It, uh, it happened in 2008 by Federation of Jewish Communities of Russia. Uh, uh, the next attempt was made in 2012 by the Russian Jewish Congress. And finally, 2013 was a, an in initiative uh, by Russian opposition party just Russia. And none of these initiatives have, have, been, have been successful. In Russia and other post-Soviet countries, this day has been observed uh, actually by Jewish national and religious organizations, but also very often with the participation of Russian top officials, including even the president of Russia in some years. But it has very clearly semi-official status. So the mode and the context of such commemoration clearly marks the space of Holocaust memory as a matter of just one of Russia's religious and national minorities, but not a matter of all Soviet, Soviet or Russian post-Soviet people. So for example, in 2010, Medvedev, he was then president of Russia, sent his greetings to participants in the ceremony uh, commemorating the uh, anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz. And in his address, he actually uh, was saying that we shouldn't forgot, forget, forget that along with six millions of people who were killed simply because of their ethnicity, there were also other victims too. And according to Nazi's plan, at least a third of population in occupied territories, in Soviet occupied territories, one third should follow their fate. And he actually referred to the fact which is well known to all people who went to school in Soviet and post-Soviet <laughs> countries about this general Ost plan, which of course nobody knows in the or no, nobody remembers in the West, at least publicly. So this attention to other victims of Nazi's genocide in Medvedev address, and also the keeping the status of International Holocaust Remembrance Day as a matter of just one of Russian Federation's national minorities, uh, reveals this intention to keep the balanced balance, um, and the balance this Jewish aspect of victimhood in World War II. It also displays the Soviet or post-Soviet determination to pre prevent the total rewriting of the Soviet originated memory narrative on the history of World War II and to avoid the recasting of its memory in accordance with the Western mode. 
So while Jewish communities, for example, in Russia join worldwide commemoration of January 20, on January 27th as an international Holocaust Remembrance Day, in the calendar of Russian state, the January 27th is also marked as a commemorating uh, the end of Leningrad siege, which is also a fact very well known to all post-Soviet and Soviet, former Soviet people. So we can talk about this disgrace of calendar <laughs> we, we, we talked uh, uh, during this conference. Uh, and this, is block, uh, this Leningrad siege lasted 900, years, uh, 900 day, days. And this is like very much part of, very important part of this whole memory narrative. So in contemporary conditions, the division line in this memory sphere work, works differently. This regarding Holocaust in post-Soviet countries becomes actually almost impossible. But emphasis on Holocaust as a very important only for Jewish community actually conveys implicit meaning of being also the Western, Western interpretation of Nazis' victimhood. So revitalization of public commemorations on April 11th in post-Soviet states actually demonstrates that the once envisaged unification of divided victimhood is not going to be achieved by one-sided acceptance of Western perspective in the West, of, or in the East, in the former East. So along with this Europeanization of memory boom, denoted by rising significance of Holocaust remembrance, the memory politics in post-Soviet countries sought to establish this alternative commemoration which could correspond to the experience of majority of former Soviet people. So a number of memorials were constructed in Russia and other post-Soviet countries, and they were built actually in 2000s. So they, re, re, uh, they show this, demonstrate this revitalization of this. And this is for Klonai Hill, but this, is, this was built in 1996. But later there is a memorial to juvenile prisoners in Kiev. And then there is this memorial in, on the site of former concentration camp for children in Belarus. It's actually very in a remote area, but they built it on the site of, of the camp. So 11th of April uh, reiterates in very many respects of the idea of commemoration of Holocaust victims. But it avoids stressing the ethnic genocide of Jews. But every publication on the 11th of April actually speaks about the five millions of former Soviet people who were held at uh, Nazi camps. And sometimes actually six, million, six millions of Jewish victims are mentioned too. But if you think about it, there is an overlap because among those six million, there were some Soviet Jews as well. I have to probably skip something. <coughs> so, um, how, how this commemoration day can, can be actually analyzed. On the one hand, the recalling of this memory of Soviet victims about prisoners of a Nazi, Nazi concentration camp uh, can be read as an effort to maintain post-Soviet countries or post-Soviet state as a remembering community. On the other hand, the persistent emphasis on the international status of this day is also very telling because Nations that once belonged to USSR, so they, they constituted one country, now they represent international community per se. So, uh, and the, the whole idea behind this also to, to force this co remembering community also as an international player on the stage, on the inter, on the stage of memori uh, memoration. Commemoration. Uh, also talking about the long-established history of Ap April 11th as an international day of observance refers to the internationalism which was characteristic to the post-war political and anti-fascist uh, uh, anti and resistant fi fighters. Uh, of course, communist ideology, I said, uh, as I mentioned already, became completely irrelevant, so it hardly ever, it's hardly ever mentioned. But bridging 
these two aspects, these post-Soviet communities as an international ones, and this, uh, and this post-Soviet community as, a, as an alternative to, to the European frame, um, is, is actually very telling. It's probably uh, well, worth to mention that there was this interna internal dynamic also, okay, which can be observed because uh, there is no Sovietness. There is, you, you, we cannot talk about the return to Sovietness in this commemoration because actually during the Soviet time, the memory of former prisoners of con concentration camps was completely marginalized. They were not among those who, who to, to be actually honored because they were not heroic. So they were not someone, they were not part, part of this master memorial narrative. Okay. Uh, secondly, there is a very evident shift from the uh, commemoration of those resistant fighters and political prisoners to juvenile uh, prisoners, so children. And again, we cannot talk about children in categories of their hero heroism of fight. They were simply victims. So there is a shift to the, and but this is of course related to the fact that those who survived until today, they are mostly juvenile. They were juvenile prisoners, so they were children at that time. So they are still um, kind of uh, can act as an agencies in this memorial work. Uh, well, but but. The, Talking about this external dynamic of, of, of this commemoration, we, we, we can clearly see that this was introduced as a response to the European commemoration work. So we can actually talk here not only about this region of memory, but also the, the, the dynamic of um, competent memory, uh, which in this, when one region arises as a, as a response to some other commemorative work. So thank you very much. That's all. Uh, thank you for presenting uh, your paper. And now we will have uh, some comments from uh, Simon Lewis. Uh, thank you very much for both papers, which I think go together very, very well. Um, Nelly discusses the construction of a memory region within the boundaries of a bygone imperial structure, whereas Rasa explores the deconstruction of the imperial experience through critical memory narratives. So if Rasa's study is an analysis of one of the major exceptions of, to the trans-regional trans, uh, discourse presented by Nelly, namely the Baltic, case, the Baltic states, as Nelly acknowledges explicitly. Um, so considered comparatively and in juxt juxtaposition, these two papers can therefore provide interesting insights into the mechanisms behind the narrativization of transnational memory, how it works for much of the post-Soviet region, and why it doesn't in a particularly exceptional case. Explicit in Nelly's and implied in Rasa's treatment is the crucial idea that the hegemony of the Soviet myth of military martyrdom left a profound mark on memorial cultures, and therefore on the national identities of the post-Soviet nations. <coughs> um, in giving a historical overview of the Cold War split between the so-called First and Second World, between a memory of victimhood and a memory of heroism, Nelly points to a strong and specific foundation for a memory region that originates in the official remembrance culture of the Soviet Union. Extending this point, one might actually argue that the USSR was itself a sui generis region of memory, a politically conditioned project for the construction of a bounded supranational community of remembrance centered on the so-called Great Patriotic War. Uh, undoubtedly, the Soviet myth wasn't totally monolithic. In all the republics, there was a certain pluralism of discourse, and, and the written world, word and visual image were vehicles for covert dissent. Nonetheless, the, the dominant frameworks uh, of narrative restricted memory in the Soviet Union in both form and content, and today's ruling elites in Russia and other post-Soviet states are working to sustain a barely adapted Soviet memory regime. Although slightly adapted, as, as Nelly uh, explained at the end. <coughs> so if Nelly's analysis is of the instrumentalization of imperial nostalgia, Rasa examines several narrative strategies for what one might, after uh, Ashcroft, Griffiths, and Tiffin, call the appropriation and abrogation of imperial discourse. Appropriation appears to take the form of cosmetic adaptation in the first phase of Lithuania's reconfiguration of memory. 
a pseudo-sacred cult of fallen warriors under the Soviet regime, is supplemented later by an outwardly, uh, sorry, is replaced by an outwardly religious Catholic revival of national and anti-Soviet martyrs. The more recent abrogation of Soviet linguistic codes by Andrius Uchkalnis, um, which is explored uh, in most detail in at least the written version of her paper, uh, is perhaps most poignant because of the breadth of its critique. The author demystifies not just the, the history with a capital H of deportations and labor camps, uh, but the full spectrum of Soviet bit, to use the Russian term, of everyday life, uh, from culinary offerings to labor and uh, sex sexual relations. <coughs> so it's noteworthy, uh, I think, that there, are also, there are also appears to be a shift from a nationalist to a universalist perspective um, in, in the standpoint of critique. Uh, Rasa argues that in Ushkalinis' books, the suffering of the Soviet years is articulated not as the suffering of the nation, but of the consumer. We might equally interpret this, I might anyway, to mean that Ushkalinis subjects the entire Soviet project to his memorial deconstruction, thereby expanding the geographical reach of a Lithuanian re-evaluation of Soviet history. In other words, his Gospels discredit the broader Soviet and post-Soviet memory region as much as they dispute the earlier nationalist Christian martyrdom. Now, it would be interesting to know if, if these books have been translated into Russian. I guess not. <coughs> um, the interaction of the national and the cosmopolitan, the specific and the universal, do does run through both papers in more complex ways, of course. Um, Nelly, quoting Elida Asman in the written version, I can't remember if he said this, names the transgenerational and transnational memory of the Holocaust as a unifying framework that conflicts with and arguably encroaches upon the post-Soviet or perhaps neo-Soviet remembering community. One question that arises is of the porosity of the contact zone between what she calls the parallel memories centered at Buchenwald and Auschwitz. First, we can know that there is a curious slippage in their construction. Uh, Buchenwald was liberated by the Americans, of course, um, <coughs> whereas Auschwitz, uh, Auschwitz was liberated by the Soviets. Um, but it's Buchenwald that be has become a, a center of neo-Soviet memory, whereas Auschwitz the center of a, a, an important symbol of wartime victimhood in Western discourse. Right? This suggests that these two regional narratives are not quite as hermetically sealed from each other as it might initially seem, but rather interlocked and mutually constitutive. The analysis presented by Nelly seems to imply that the old imperial center of Moscow is the gravitational center of the heroic memory symbolized by April the 11th. In what ways, then, does it radiate to the post-Soviet periphery? Is this narrative propagated mainly by the Russian state and Orthodox Church? And if so, what roles are played by political alliances, formal and informal, such as the Euro Eurasian Economic Union, or in the Baltic, the, the European Union? And what role do religion and culture play in the consolidation of hegemonic memory narratives? Um, and here I would ask how, if at all, do Ukraine, Armenia, and Kazakhstan, say, vary in the configuration of this post-Soviet memory constellation, and how do they compare with the Lithuanian exception explicated by Rasa. <coughs> Closer comparative examination of how well-rooted this Russian, uh, Russo-centric memories uh, are would surely reveal significant variety and heterogeneity, complicating the idea of a post-Soviet memory region. One burning question that remains after hearing Rasa's presentation relates to the question of the Holocaust. Uh, it's well known at least it seems well known to me, that the revisionism commonly known as the double genocide thesis is particularly rooted in the Baltic states, where anti-Soviet sentiment uh, conditions a commemorative economy according to which national martyrdom is placed in opposition to remembrance of Jewish suffering, uh, which some people argue leads to an ob obfuscation of the Holocaust. My point here is not to criticize Lithuanian memorial practices by imposing norms of what should or should not be remembered, but to inquire about whether and how the supposedly universalist memory of the Holocaust finds expression as an instrument for the disavowing of the imperial Soviet heritage. If we follow 
Nelly's vision of two parallel memories of war, one might assume that embracing a Western, victim-based and inclusive paradigm memory would actually be a pragmatic strategy. But uh, you actually seem to suggest that there's something completely different going on. Um, <clears throat> in Rasa's paper, it suggested that a strictly nationalist agenda and later universalist consumerist, a universal consumerist stance are debunking the Soviet way of remembering, um, but without this normative memory of the Holocaust. So are these narratives at odds with the Western narrative of the Holocaust victims, or are they supplemented? Can they coexist within the same national mythology? And to what extent are memory regions, when examined close up, constituted by internally agonistic tropes of memory, whereby local nationalist narratives, broader regional histories, and globalized memory uneasily cohabit the same symbolic spaces? Um, these two rich and very insightful presentations have supplied a useful case study into the operation of transnational memory within a single politically and historically defined region. The nation states that emerged in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union were in many ways very different, of course, but each was faced with a choice of how to remember the Soviet era. <coughs> uh, these two papers have highlighted and problematized some of the intriguing and unpredictable ways in which memory narratives escape from the container of the nation state, affected by larger discourses, such as the normative memory of the, Holo of the Holocaust, uh, challenged by global capital and consumerist culture, or conditioned by formal and informal supernatural st supranational structures. Uh, so in finishing, I'd like to pose a set of questions to, to, to both of you, to both authors, um, in the hope of refining some of the insight they've provided. Questions to, to Rasa, as I already said, what about the Holocaust? How does it fit into the bigger picture of Soviet and wartime remembrance? Um, secondly, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced by your linear chronology, or linear progression, or what it, what it seems to be an implied linear chron uh, progression of um, phases of remembering. If you take those museums, the, the first ones that open the Museum of Genocide, the crosses, they're still there, yeah. right? Um, so the analysis suggests to me that memory is, is disputed and what we have is an accumulation of antagonistic ideas rather than a, uh, you know, a development as such. Um, and yeah, there's, I don't need to say much more about that. Uh, thirdly, um, <coughs> what Ushkalinis calls the boredom of the Soviet Union, I find this very interesting. Um, because in my own interactions with, uh, with people from places like Russia and Belarus, uh, there's a great nostalgia about certain aspects of, of Soviet culture. So he says that you know, people are so bored that they made robots out of cigarette packets. Um, there's some great Soviet films, of course, yeah. great Soviet literature. None of, not, not all of it was censored. Um, and also people uh, of our generation. Um, do tend to be quite nostalgic. They, they love their Soviet cartoons. They quote their Soviet uh, uh, films. Um, they watch Slyokin Param every New Year still, apparently. Um, <coughs> does this not exist in Lithuania? Is Ushkalinis right? Um, and is this more of a... Uh, is this another way in which Lithuania is different? <coughs> Questions to Nelly. Uh, so you say that 11th of... April is commemorated in Russia and other, other po post-Soviet states. Can you be more specific about which countries you're talking about? Which of, the, which of these countries makes a particularly big deal out of this holiday, and why? Um, can you also be more specific as to the mechanisms of the propagation of this memory? Is it mainly the state, uh, the Russian state? Or are there other states involved? Um, or is there more of an interaction between vernacular and official memory? Um, and finally, use words such as parallel or alternative memories to suggest that each transnational narrative is self-contained and autonomous. But is this uh, really the case? If in, say, Belarus or, Belarus or Russia, local Jewish groups are among those maintaining and promoting non-Soviet uh, regime of memory, mode of memory, um, of the Holocaust in particular, are there commemorative actions not constitutive, constitutive of some kind of in-between space between the local and the global, the Eurasian and the Western, maybe something like what Baba, Homi Baba calls the, uh, the third zone. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I'll finish there. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, now uh, our speakers will respond to uh, Simon's comments. Then we will collect the questions from the audience, uh, and um, uh, Rasa and Nelly will uh, answer your uh, questions. So, Rasa, could you please start? Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> so, uh, I will just first cross-check the questions. The first question was about how this uh, genocide fit into these patterns of remembrance. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a really good question. I'm not really too ready to answer it, to answer it because uh, it's just so many things come to my mind, but everything is still, you know, disorganized, and I really have to think about it. First of all, the late pattern of remembers, as described by Ushkolnis, is completely apolitical. So it, it's focused just on everyday life, on this people deprived of pleasures of consumption. And the early years, like building crosses and commemorating the grievances, and especially this uh, church of Lithuanian sufferers, and so forth and so on, it's still focused mostly on national sufferings. So this remembrance of Holocaust, remembrance of genocide, exist a little bit, I would say, in a parallel way, in a kind of parallel culture of remembrance, and national sufferings exist a little bit like a, you know, autonomous universe, and remembrance of Holocaust exists as autonomous universe. This is just my hypothesis. I'm, I never taught about it when writing this paper, so I'm, I'm not really re ready to answer. And a uh, lot of things now, uh, after you ask the question, a lot of things coming to my mind. Maybe I can, we can discuss it later, okay? About the second question was about the chronology and it's whether it's like one type of memory is substituting previous type of memory. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, m it's more like accumulation and overlapping different layers of memory and the genocide museum is still there, and the Hill of Crosses is still there, but this is new layers of memory developing, and new communities of remembrance are developing, because this this course of national sufferings, it was never commercialized, it was never kind of mainstream, it never attracted so such a big audiences like Ushkalnis with his with his volumes, with his gospel. So, but yeah, it's in fact, it's a very good point. It's about accumulation of different memories and development of different layers. And the third question was about nostalgia, right? So it's very interesting. Some nostalgia exists, in but, but again, it's mostly, it was never articulated or institutionalized in a way. And what I'm speaking about, about kind of institutionalized and, you know, about cultural artifacts. And the nostalgia exists, but it, it exists as individual, as individual attitude, as personal memory, as personal relation with the Soviet space, but it was never articulated in a, on a larger, larger scale, on collective scale and on official or institutionalized scale. And what Oshkolnes does, he is very well aware of this nostalgia. And basically, his, his gospels are a little bit of political project because what he's saying, his aim is to dispel to the nostalgia and to remind people how things really were at that time. Okay? So, did I answer your questions? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, does, yeah. So, about this. Um, First, about this opposition between Buchenwald and Auschwitz. Uh, indeed, Buchenwald was uh, liberated by the American troops and Auschwitz by Soviets. But the thing is, like, the Buchenwald was a camp for political prisoners. So Jews uh, did uh, were among those who were imprisoned there, but they didn't constitute a majority. The majority, at the moment of liberation, actually, the majority were Soviet political prisoners. And then the second group was uh, Pol Polish political prisoners, French, etc., etc. So there was this different com um, 
different people who, who were kept. So this, I think this is how it became uh, attracted this attention. If, uh, and secondly, of course, uh, there is a fact that there was a surprising of uh, rebels, which was in, in the, uh, these rebels were communists, anti-fascists from France, from from Soviet Union. So this was all the whole story. And actually, the story of Buchenwald was pretty much part of the Soviet canon of memory, because there was a very famous song, Buchenwald Bells. Uh, uh, so the whole this, this narrative of Soviet memorial practices also behind. So th this was immediately recognized by all s former Soviet people, uh, this Buchenwald. But I think that the major thing is it's about these political prisoners in Buchenwald, while Auschwitz was uh, was a place for uh, for uh, Jew Jewish Jewish uh, victims, so this is how I think it became. You know, they switched this, uh, the the meaning. Uh, uh, thinking about this more uh, more, more precise uh, countries, actually, uh, most of memorials, for example, um, I, I showed some of them. They are in on the sides of. Uh, Previous uh, concentration camps. So, because of this, uh, uh, they are in former occupied territories by Nazis. So, in Belarus, in most of because in Belarus there are several of them, uh, because the largest one was actually in a very remote area, far away. But uh, as you could see, the, the, the it's, it's a very big uh, memorial complex built in the middle in the middle of nowhere. It's actually very interesting because this is a classroom with a board. Uh, but empty ones, so this is kind of uh, uh, referring to children who were kept at this. At this uh, so, which, are con which countries, uh, so these memorials are in former occupied territories. In Crimea, there are several, several of them. In Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic countries. In Latvia, there is a huge memorial, but it was built during the Soviet time, actually, also commemorating uh, former prisoners of the concentration camps. Uh, so this is one level of commemorative uh, practices. This is memorial. Those are memorials. Uh, so they are in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic countries. Uh, and this is pretty much that. But at the same time, there is this uh, union of juven former juvenile prisoners. The, on the website, there is a list of national uh, unions, and it uh, uh, the countries which are on, on this uh, list is uh, all three Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia. But what I know from my own experience, uh, the commemorative events take place not only in those countries, because there, there are events taking place in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan as well. Uh, I'm not sure about Azerbaijan and Georgia, but um, Armenia for sure. So it's, it's a kind of, it's, um, it's difficult to, to say, because on the one hand, there is this element of grassrootedness. So there are people on the ground who are involved personally with their personal histories in this. And they live in former occupied territories as well. Or they were somehow relocated during the Soviet time. So when, but they somehow maintain this. But of course, there is a second level, because they were, their memories were very much politicized and involved into this geopolitics of memory and victimhood. Uh, so there are this second, se several layers on, at which you can look at what is happening. And of course, the, the, the result can be very surprising because on the one hand, we, we can observe all these commemorations. And also, as I mentioned, very many educational events take place. So children from schools, they are organized, uh, they, are organized they come to this rally, they, they have these uh, special lessons, they, they have these meetings with former prisoners, etc. So this is a memory which involves this very much communication. But on the other hand, for example, these former political, uh, former juvenile prisoners still fight to be recognized and to be granted the same rights as veterans, for example, in Russia. And they didn't uh, manage to do this even until today. So they are, on the one hand, they are present on this symbolic map of memory, but they are not really, they are still have, have a lot of problems in, in order to receive also legal support uh, from the state. So it's, a, it's, a, it's much more complicated than just like, this glory of memory. 
thank you. We still have uh, quite a lot of time, so uh, I encourage you to ask uh, questions. Do we have any? Yes, uh, those lady over there first. We'll collect a few questions. There was five people, I think. Yes, six. Okay, so we'll collect those questions and uh, then uh, we'll have the responses. Uh, I've got a very, okay. I've got a short question to Rasa because when you were talking about these books uh, written by this, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the writer. Uh, it reminded me like a book written by the Moldovan writer Vasile Erno, which was entitled like a Born in USSR. So the guy born at the beginning of the 70s, he was just basically describing his uh, childhood and then uh, the adolescent years uh, spent in the uh, USSR. And it was also something on the border between the nostalgia, but on the other hand, it was some kind of uh, attempt to make a, uh, to show the this, this situation as a mock, to ridicule uh, the system of USSR in the 70s and 80s. And I just wanted to ask you about the language with this Lithuanian writer is using, like uh, whether this is attempt also to ridicule the past, to, to, to describe this past in, in this, like, how ridiculous it was. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you. Uh, thank you. Two very quick questions. One to Rasha. Um, the book you talked about, what was the reception of this? And if it's re is it really enough to talk about a new tendency? And the other one to Nelly. Uh, Buchenwald is obviously a bit of a peculiar place because it has this double history, right? I mean, the camp was not only a Nazi concentration camp, but then was transformed um, afterwards to, um, yeah, into, I don't know how to call it, uh, but yeah, like the, the communist regime was using it as well, let's put it that way, which created huge problems afterwards when it came to commemoration. So I'm almost a bit surprised that the 11th of April became so prominent in other uh, post-Soviet countries. And I was wondering if there's any discussion about that at all. Hi, my comments and question are for uh, Rasa. So I very much appreciated your presentation. And I thought that the timeline was very helpful. It gives a kind of sketch of what's going on so that, so that people can get kind of a big picture overview of the discourse over time. And that's a very ambitious project. And I'm trying to do something similar. And so I have a question about methods, which with a project like this that's a longitudinal study where you're attempting to characterize the discourse surrounding memory over a period of time and you're looking at you know, discourses present in, in the cultural realm. This is very, this is big, this is a big project. And so, how do you decide what to include, what not to include? What counts as a source of evidence for discourse? And, you know, I mean, the project could be completely overwhelming. So, there's some criteria that must come to mind to figure out, okay, if I'm going to categorize or describe a discourse based on certain works of art, monuments, literature, et cetera, what am I going to look at? So my question is a question about your methods. How did you uh, make those judgments? How did you make those discernments? What type of criteria did you use? Thank you. Thank you both for your wonderful talks, and I have a question to Nelly. Uh, Buchenwald as a site, or go going back to, to what Aline has said, but more to the contemporary uh, con contemporaneous of, this, of Buchenwald as, is, as it is today. It's interesting because it has been uh, uh, remade, or at least the exhibition, the, the exhibition was remade in the, in the 1990s by the uh, Western Germans to change the to, to, to change the Soviet story into a new story, but at the same time uh, it serves to uh, present the different types of victims, not only the Holocaust victims, but different types of uh, uh, of the of the Nazi victims. It's being remain remade now once again, so it's also interesting. And my question would be: Are there any interaction between the let's say post-Soviet actors in the let's say the real post-Soviet uh, state and the uh, Gem who works on the exhibition today and how it, uh, and if they are, how they look like. 
I have a question to Raza. Uh, you presented the post-Soviet memory culture as part of this uh, uh, consumerist culture in the uh, newly developing capitalism. It will be a bit of a stupid question, but still I want to ask it. Do you see an uh, uh, option of an alternative interpre interpretation that uh, in a more psychoanalytical direction, that it would be a kind of working through a trauma of the socialist period. Uh, for example, this working through laughter, it is uh, very typical in, uh, as in other cases. Uh, two more questions from the second row. Uh, yes, there were. Uh, and maybe we'll try to do the next turn. Um, one can see this. Um capitalist thing of commemoration in many, many countries around the world. And I would be very much interested in the effect on the audience, especially on um, children or younger generations. I mean, in what sense does it affect people and shape also commemoration or remembrance or history? Um, yeah, thank you so for the presentations, and I, I would like to, to ask Sang Russia, um, you, uh, you presented Sang, um, the, the work Sang, of Mr. Ushkalnis uh, as one source Sang, that, um, well, the, the local society or Sang, in, in Lithuania Sang, put much more attention Sang, to I would say, the everyday life history. Um, are there other sources uh, than for this? Are uh, than after 25 years, and um, mainly than looking to, to suppression or gulag, that they now then, as well as historians, as um, ethnologists, than try to um, to focus on other themes like everyday life and um, and which importance have these images which were produced then during the Soviet Union um, for example by TV uh, recently then I uh, I met someone who wrote then a big book then about then the Soviet <coughs> TV and which images and was produced by them uh, by series or by local TV channels, but we have to be aware that this big country, Soviet Union, was also separated. Like each a Soviet Republic had his own local TV channel, and so we have to be to have to keep this in mind, and also like, the differences between, let's say, um, perestroika area and a Stalinist area. Uh, what does it mean then if we re remember how we behaved and, and uh, yeah, which, which consumerism then, uh, we had then in certain periods and uh, also what, is, what might be positive. Uh, for example, just came to my mind, um, people often remind they have plenty of times and they have much time for friends, families, and hobbies. Uh, had this any importance? Okay. Um, just to, to cross check, so your yeah. question was first about the periodization. Right? Yeah, periodization and which images were produced, were adopted, mm -hmm. um, for example, by TV, um, including the local uh, circumstances like in Lithuania. Hmm? Okay. Okay, so now we'll move to the uh, answers. So, Rasan, uh, could you please? Uh okay, yeah, thank you very much for all your questions. Uh, the first question is Moldovan writer, and is Andrew Sushkal is trying to ridicule the past? Yes, obviously, yes. As I said, he is kind of a uh, songwriter, anthem writer for uh, supermarkets. That's, uh, I call him ironically. Uh, He's, he's openly capitalist, pro-capitalist, liberal, and he doesn't hide it, okay? And uh, he's obviously, I, from the quotes that I provided, he's obviously using very strong language and 
very close to open insults when he's speaking about the uh, Soviet past. And he states clearly in the beginning of his book that sometimes, you know, human mind works in that way that we tend to be nostalgic about things, we forget bad things and we memorize good things. And my aim, as he says clearly, my aim is to dispel this nostalgia and to remind things how the things really were. But again, this is his version. This is his version how things really were. He's omitting a lot of a lot of other things like communal feeling of belonging, being part of factory, <laughs> being for part of team. This is again, he's not being objective and he's not saying he's objective. He's asserting this new capitalist mentality that, you know, consume, do your own business, be successful, live in full, have all the things that you like. And did I, did I answer your question? Okay. Uh, the second question, what was the reception and is it enough to speak about a new pattern of remembrance? As basically, the reception <laughs> it's overlapping with uh, other questions about the psychoanalytical perspective <laughs> and trauma and so on. It was lots of, he is very controversial figure. He introducing himself as the most read, most popular, uh, most read author in Lithuanian language. I'm, I'm not sure how true it is, but he's most hated, definitely, most hated writer who's writing in Lithuanian language. So this is a lot of hatred and a lot of admiration, okay? And this is, I think, this, he makes this was very good question about trauma and uh, how, you know, dealing with trauma and psychoanalytical approach because he triggers a lot of anger and degree of anger is equal to degree of admiration. I mean, no one is indifferent or everyone has an attitude about him and everyone says, oh, I never read him, <laughs> but the, the books are sold. And uh, is it enough to speak about the culture, new culture of remembrance? That's the few books, the, the two books, they have been very successful. And he does also a lot of other things. He has his own column, Decipher Russia, and he's like writing about different aspects of Soviet lives, life about Soviet films. And if the things, there are also other things happening, as I pointed out at the end of my presentation. There are two museums, or not museums, or some small sub-chapter subdivisions in the museums devoted to Soviet everyday life. So I think this, these are kind of signals, at least maybe this is not a new pattern of remembrance, but this is a very clear signal that the new pattern of remembrance is developing. Okay? And the question about the methods, actually, <laughs> I was pleased that you spoke in a very big words about big longitudinal <coughs> project, because it was just an essay produced just for this conference. <laughs> and well, this is this is this is this is a good point. I have to elaborate this methodology and how I choose this aspects or include or exclude. And basically, my focus was on kind of, of something that is institutionalized, you know, public, popular, mainstream, that everyone knows. It's not, I know that from sociological perspective, this criteria is insufficient, but this is, this is what I'm analyzing, the public memory, popular memory, institutionalized memory. So it's, I mean, there are some minor museums or some books published in like 500 copies, so it's, and I know I, I agree with you that this is a weak point and it has to define to be defined better. So it's my choice was this either the cultural artifacts are important, they are mainstream, they are kind of state level, or they attract big audiences, so kind of blurred. But this is what I have. And the question the questions about yeah, about the question about trauma. That's a really good question about trauma. And thanks a lot for the question. I agree very much with that. That is kind of coping with trauma, speaking about it in a very rude, very strong language, very offensive language. 
and trying to deal with your own past and showing other people that look at the way your past has been. I mean, <laughs> I could talk for an hour about this. It, it fits very much what you said. It fits very much uh, my other paper I'm writing about Soviet Union. As a Soviet Union, as a kind of system of pathological homeostasis, like pathological homeostasis, like it's like dysfunctional family, let's say your dad is alcoholic, and everyone is like, in order to maintain some balance in a family, children and wife just don't speak, like pretend that it's nothing happens. So it's like they kind of establish kind of like a balance. We are okay, no, it didn't happen, right? You know what I mean. Okay. So the Soviet Union at large was kind of system of pathological hemostasis. There are so many bad things, but people, in order to kind of maintain the normalcy of everyday life, people pretend that these things are never happening. And what happens in a situation of pathological hemostasis, that when someone starts speaking out that look, our family is not normal, our dad is alcoholic, then the family is not blaming the dad, but the family is blaming the person who speaks out about the problem. So it's very similar to with Andrew Zushkalnis. He speaks about the problems that we had and we still have, and he triggers a lot of anger. And I mean, thank you very much for this question. It's just brilliant. And you gave me hint for future work and interpretation. And the receptions of the receptions of the volume, as I said, it's I answered it already, it's volume of anger and volume of admiration of I don't know, but are immense. And the last question of periodization, if I, I'm still not sure if I understand it correctly, like which period Andrew Sushkalnis is focusing on, like perestroika or late socialism, or? Well, so the question then, how, which images were produced like, uh, by um, yeah, different like, uh -huh. means like um, Soviet Union TVs, and how the, these images were adopted and on different times. Uh, uh -huh. Well, a good question. I have to think about this. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I really have to think about this. Uh, um, I, think I, I don't think I can answer it at the moment. Yes, okay. So um, um, first question about the, the story of Buchenwald, because obviously in uh, late after the mm, victory and the end of the Second World War, uh, there was a Soviet camp. And it did, uh, the, the, this fact is present in the narrative on the history of Buchenwald, but it's not given into in, uh, any consideration in this memorial narrative. Because when you look at these publications on the 11th of April, on this International Day, on the events, what they, re they reproduce absolutely the same pattern. They say about the date, it was established immediately after the war. It, it has an international resonance. And then it, there is a whole story about the history of concentration camps in general. How many of them existed, how many people were there uh, held, how many people uh, uh, were killed, etc. So there is no particular story. So is this story of Buchenwald is not involved very much. So it was taken as a symbol but it, it's not narrated every time. So it's actually very much um, uh, ab abstract name for all, uh, all concentration camp, but it fitted the idea of uh, camp not only for Jews, but all, for others as well. So this was used as an icon. So it became an icon of a name to be reproduced, but without much reference to the story of this particular camp. And the same I can say about the um, interaction between this juvenile, the, the international union of former juvenile prisoners. Um, and actually, I just realized that I didn't answer one of the Simon's questions about the, the interaction in general with other actors on the memory arena. 
uh, among their partners, for example, there are Jewish organizations, national organizations, religious organizations. Among partners of this union also there are um, unions of political prisoners, including those of Stalinist camps. So they very much part of this whole interactive uh, <coughs> arena. Uh, but in, when it comes to the cooperation with Buchenwald, I haven't found any traces, but they do go to some international meetings taking place at other memorials uh, and other camp, former camps. So they do participate, but they not necessarily with Buchenwald per se. So again, it, 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 it comes to the fact that Buchenwald became a part of the, uh, became this symbol, this icon, but it's not very much about Buchenwald history. So yeah, and, but they are, they are do, they do go to Germany to some other uh, camps. I, I, I can't remember ex exactly which, but there, there are in, there is an, uh, there are reports on the travelings and then the meeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but not to Buchenwald. Uh, thank you very much. As we uh, already run out of uh, time, I would like to uh, close uh, this uh, panel and uh, thank you all uh, the audience, participants and uh, discussant for, uh, for participating. Uh, and uh, now we'll move to the short uh, summary of the uh, conference that will be given by Joanna Wawrzyniak, Małgorzata Pakier and uh, Simon Lewis. Thank you once again.